Hello and welcome to ET Brand Equity presents The Big Leap, powered by Clevertap, an exclusive chat show featuring pioneers from India's 12 largest and fastest growing brands. I'm your host, Gautam Srinivasan, and during these conversations, we'll bring you an inside look into the growth stories and success mantras of businesses that have taken a big leap and understand the nuts and bolts of how they identify gaps in the market and created solutions which transform consumer behavior. Well, about today's story, it's commonly said that there is a huge untapped potential in India's tier 2 and tier 3 markets, so much so that it has the ability to drive the engine of the economy. So in 2016, two IIT graduates decided to harness the potential of this region. They created a platform called Misho, which also means my shop in short. The small businesses and individuals could start their business from home with zero investment. Now this opened the gates for millions of small businesses and entrepreneurs who joined the platform and listed their products for people across the country and gave a huge boost to social commerce. So do you want to know more about the story? Do you want to know how they did it? Then let's log into this wide ranging conversation with Anjeev Banwal, who is the founder and CTO of Misho and Kirti Varun Avasarla, who is the chief product officer of Misho. Kirti, great to have you on board for a very interesting conversation about a very interesting brand. But before we get to the brass tacks, let's get to know both of you as people. So Sanjeev, we'll start with you because you've had quite a journey from, from Ranchi to Delhi and then Tokyo and Bangalore. You have, you've been around the world, you've den, done many things. Take us through first about your evolution during this entire journey to lead such a big firm. Uh, how did you grow as an individual and as a leader? Because I also want to mention here that you sp spoke in an interview and said that building things is easy for techies, but building the right thing is hard. So how would you rate yourself as a builder as well? Right? Yeah. No, hi, hey everyone. I think um, great to be here. A uh, lot of learnings that we're planning to share today. Um, I grew up in a small town in Jharkhand. Uh, did my B.Tech from IT Delhi and then spent about three years in Sony in Tokyo. Um, Sony was at forefront of camera technology then, so pretty interesting journey there. But uh, yeah, I think after that we kind of decided to start up and uh, yeah, a lot of learnings there. Uh, as I said, just I for yourself as an individual, what would you, if you met yourself right now, if your if your younger self met you right now, what would you say to say to him? Definitely say that there is a moment when you're still trying to figure out whether you should jump into entrepreneurship or not. Mm. I'd go back and say that that is the right decision. <laughs> Massive personal learning. I think I started as a tech co-founder. My responsibility mm. was to you know, build everything tech, right? So I would write, build the app, build the backend, Android and everything. Mm. And right there to managing a team, to kind of taking it to, right now we have about 700 odd techies in Misho trying to build for this massive user base. Mm. And the amount of satisfaction that we get by looking at what we have created, enabling millions of people in India to come and transact online, mm. which was never possible earlier. So definitely, am I the best builder? No. <laughs> am I better than where we started? Definitely, yes. Lot of learnings personally in terms of, so I think writing code is easier. Mm. Managing team is much, much harder because now you have to kind of get everyone to be motivated by the passion towards you know, solving your users' problems, or problems that come with scale. Mm. But uh, yeah, I think biggest learning was uh, being closer to our users. I think we have ourselves iterated the business model multiple times, but mm. that was a big change compared to when we started. We thought, okay, we are going in with an idea. Probably this is going to be big enough, but as mm. you go deeper, speak to users, you realize this is not the biggest thing. There's a lot more possible. Just scratch the surface. And that, yeah. as you mentioned, it's also your evolution where sometimes you just feel, you know, I just want to code. But yeah. here comes this responsibility yeah. of managing the people as well. But as you do it, you yourself grow as an individual and as Definitely. a leader. We'll expand on that and see how that transformation transformed an entire social commerce ecosystem 
But before that, Kirti, let me come to you because you have many passions, uh, reading included, driving, and I believe there's, there's jazz there as well. So lots of passion, but I want to focus on the reading aspect. You read a lot of non-fiction. What's on your reading list this year? Firstly, great to be here, Dr. Uh, the reading list is long. Many fascinating books uh, have come up in, in the last year. I think that two of the ones which stand out for me, I think one is Build mm -hmm. uh, by Tony Fidel. Uh, this is the guy who actually conceptualized iPod, iPhone as part of Apple. Uh, and, and this book actually is about not just building great products, but also building your career, building yourself as a person. So a lot of great insights on how to build mm -hmm. uh, anything of great value. I think I love that book. Uh, the second one, which is a, on a completely different topic, is a book called Lifespan. Uh, this is by David Sinclair. So this actually talks about uh, human longevity. Mm. So how, why we age as human beings and what can we do to reverse aging? Okay. And there are a lot of counterintuitive <laughs> insights on uh, uh, the diet, the lifestyle, even how technology affects our aging. And a lot of very interesting insights I took away, which I never knew about. So, so it's a non-linear way of thinking about Absolutely. as we age, you know, what, what happens. So yeah. some recommendations there for Kirti, <laughs> for all of our viewers who are watching, many of whom are startup founders. So maybe they could get a leg up and get inspired about <laughs> what they do. So thank you for sharing your reading list. Right. Let's get back to the histories, the origin point, And then we go on to the story about, you know, how me show does it right when it comes to retaining customers. So Sanjeev, we'll come to you on this aspect and then Kirti will ask you a follow-up on that. Back when you were with Sony in Japan, you were working with various product lineups in, uh, in you know, including DSLR, Cybershot and Xperia high-end uh, phones and Xperia was one of your key highlights. So what made you return after three years and taking this big leap and starting up with, with it, your batchmate at IIT Delhi? Uh, I think it was called Fashni or what something that you started. Uh, so what lessons did you learn from that experience which you applied to the founding of Misho? Yeah, I think in Sony, so two years into the job, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a decent job, well paying, interesting problems to be solved. Camera was one of the best, one of the top two, if I remember correctly, uh, in Xperia. So interesting problem statements, but two years into the job. Mm -hmm. I realized what next? What do I want from my life? And that is where I thought maybe this is the time when you go out and create something which has massive impact. The amount of satisfaction that that is going to give mm. will never be come from current job. So that is that was a starting point. Mm. So and this was around 2014, 15, early 2015, startup ecosystem was booming. And what better than India, where you have so many problems to be solved at scale, mm. waiting to be disrupted. So yeah, that is when I called with it and we kind of got aligned that this so is the right just time. just a call, just a call you guys spoke yes. and suddenly I think here it's you an were. interesting story. So it took us just a month. So spoke on day one, mm -hmm. day 30 I resigned and day 45 I was in India. Wow. So I think that That's goes the level back. of conviction you had exactly. in your idea. That is because we spent about four years together working mm -hmm. in a lot of projects. He was a very good friend in college as well. Mm -hmm. So trust was always there. Mm -hmm. Now it was about is this the right time to jump into entrepreneurship? All right. I mean, so that explains your movement into entrepreneurship. So then Pashnia started. From yeah. there, what lessons uh, did you learn which you applied to Misho? Yeah, I think Pashnia, so Pashnia stands for passion nearby, which is mm. essentially we started with this understanding of, and even now, if you see large part of the retail market is unorganized and offline, mm. right? 90% is offline. So we wanted to solve this problem, which is trying to bring your unorganized retail online. And we started with trying to bring in local shops, local fashion shops online in an app. And it did not work. A lot of learnings around, say, selection in fashion is much, much more important than the delivery time, for example. Mm -hmm. Hyperlocal setup, you just cannot have big enough selection to attract a lot of users. So big learning there, but I think bigger learning was when you're trying to start in a new domain, and e-commerce was new to us in the sense we knew about it, but we have ne never spent a lot of time in understanding it. So as you go deeper in a new domain, you'll end up unlocking and discovering a lot more problems, mm. bigger opportunities, which means being open to iterating on your idea itself, not being wedded to initial idea with which you start was the biggest learning. And we have continued Keep kind of moving with your idea. Exactly. I think being open-minded towards discovering new opportunities is the mm. crux of it. All right. On that note, let me come to you, Kirti, because discovering new opportunities can be great, but there's always a thought in the back of someone's mind 
as to what if things go wrong. And I ask this question in the context of when we look at your resume, right? You work with Amazon and Flipkart and you joined Misho and a few months later, the pandemic lockdown started. So what was going through your mind at that point in time? And how does it feel when Misho overtakes, now overtakes both Amazon and Flipkart uh, in terms of becoming the world's most downloaded shopping app uh, during the first half of 2022 and becoming India's largest resale platform? Do you feel vindicated? Yeah, I think it's a surreal experience to say the least. Uh, at the time when I joined Misho, it was not an easy decision. Mm. I was at Flipkart, I was doing very well. Uh, and Misho obviously was a much, much smaller company. But uh, as I spoke to Vidit Sanjeev and other folks at that time, I did understand that Misho actually had unearthed a very interesting opportunity in India, especially social commerce, the Bharat user segment, which I think the other biggies had not focused on because they thought it is not going to be a big opportunity. Mm. Right? Uh, that is something that stuck to me and I realized that, okay, while this is small today, it has a potential to become very big. Mm. Uh, and also, I like the people that I met and I, I took the plunge, it was a risk. Uh, and then COVID hit, lockdowns, the business sort of came to a standstill. But uh, fortunately, what happened was once the lockdowns got lifted, mm. I think the business started hyper growing. Mm. And, and COVID actually in some ways created so many tailwinds, it almost became like the demonetization type event for e-commerce, right? Mm -hmm. Offline to online shift started happening. And that's when we started building from strength to strength. We started focusing more broadly on not just social commerce, but e-commerce. We built our entire uh, app and everything else that you see today, literally brick by brick since then. And, and yeah, we are where we are now, <laughs> where I think the business has grown a lot. I think the biggest keys to success, I think like Sanjeev also mentioned earlier, has been that user first mindset, mm -hmm. being very open-minded, and understanding what are the new problems that you can solve and not having a bias around whether others have tried it, whether it has worked or not, taking a very fresh perspective to problems and then solving them in a very product and technology driven manner. Absolutely. I think those are the things that have worked the most for us. Mm -hmm. And in this process also, the other great thing that I think Misho has done is also build a great culture in terms of attracting great talent. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't have great talent, you can't actually <laughs> achieve all the things that, that we have, right? So overall, I think, it's been a surreal experience, like I said, and, and the good part is we're still in very early stages, right? If you look at e-commerce market overall, with all of the stuff that Misho and everybody else has done, still the penetration is 5 or 6%. That's right? the of fascinating aspect of it, where commerce. others might see, oh my God, this is a high growth phase. It's actually just the beginning and there's more Absolutely. to come, more exciting developments yeah. to come. But speaking of some of the points that you raised here, KV, let me get you to comment on that, especially on the user first aspect, right? Because whenever you're launching an idea, you're trying to understand the user's problem. So from that perspective, what were the key problem areas uh, that you were trying to solve Sandeep, along with it, uh, especially when we look at, you know, Misha and its mission to sort of democratize yeah. e-commerce for people in India, millions in India and post the launch as you sort of got, uh, got around 50% month on month, yeah. grew 50% month on month. What were some of the highlights of your earliest customer conversations? For example, say housewives who were using the platform to run their boutiques, you know. How did those conversations shape the way Misho 1.2 tuned its focus for user return? So, so just to set some context here, like Misho 1.0, we're trying to build a platform to mm -hmm. enable resellers, mostly housewives, to run their own online business mm -hmm. on WhatsApp and Facebook. Biggest problem, and this also we discovered through kind of user conversations. So it's an interesting story. Like, so first we built a version which was more like Shopify for mobile in India, which mm. is resellers will come, create their own online boutique, and kind of find their own sort of supply chain, <coughs> sorry, add products, and then kind of start selling. When we went back to these users, and this is interesting um, user which was named Anu's boutique, and she was running a online business named Nanu's Boutique. The way she used to run it was, she and her husband used to every quarter go to Surat, mm. take contacts of individual suppliers, add them to WhatsApp groups, and start getting product pictures from them. It's a very unorganized way of doing business. Now, the thing about social commerce is, it's impulse buying. So you mm. need constant supply of fresh product, which means you need a lot of supplier connections. So we discovered that supply is one of the big problems, mm. which is holding social commerce back in India. And that was one big insight in kind of building this first version. We built a very minimal marketplace, MVP version of this marketplace, which just enabled users to find new supply. Mm. 
then we went went ahead with it launched it very interestingly we saw obviously this is solving a core problem but when we launched it one of the very fundamental feature is sharing on whatsapp because that is where they do business with again here we built something there's an option of sharing to whatsapp we launched it nobody was using it mm. and very difficult to understand the functionality works why are people not using it they kept complaining i am not able to share i don't find good products we went back to them we spoke to them very big insight there that the kind of phones that they had was very low end and here as engineer you always have probably high end smartphone engineering for a high end <laughs> smartphone and you especially have big history. wrong <laughs> big big mistake so you have high end smartphones you have mm. very good internet bandwidth mm. you have wi fi here so you you are in a city so you just don't see those problems mm. that is when we realize that investing a lot up front in making sure your app is performant in low end smartphones as well as unstable internet bandwidth going aggressive on the caching side and all of these problems have fantastically been solved by whatsapp which is one of the main apps that these users have always used mm. now loading in background and so on so again all of this happened only because we went back to our users every time to discover problems understand what is working what is not so But that yeah. helps you build her indian ka apna market yeah. as you say yeah. i want to expand on that thought on basis something that you wrote on twitter that an interesting measure for the success of a technology is people taking it for granted and yeah. here you had that process you spoke to users understood what they need yeah. you got those insights and you enacted it so could you expand on this thought that you mentioned in twitter in the context of how you made e-commerce accessible yeah. to almost 50% of your new customers for for whom this yeah. was a completely new experience altogether yeah. the issue that you mentioned earlier that could be seen as i'm experienced but this is a an either an infrastructural issue yeah. or a ui issue but what about those users who never yeah. gone online never done e-commerce how did you make it a habit for them to use the service no agree i think we operate with this mindset of if you're trying to build a great technology it should just work Mm. you just should not have to think about it at all and when you're trying to build for ea2 plus users most of the time they would have used apps like whatsapp facebook that's it they have never transacted online which means you have to minimize the cognit- cognitive overload that they go through when they come to your app start browsing the products so making the ux very simple which means even simpler things which are taken for granted in if you're trying to build for high end users is let's say hamburger icon Is you hide options behind certain menu doesn't work for our users. Mm. So putting everything up front, leveraging a lot of image heavy actions to enable users to understand how do you go to a particular category. Mm. We recently launched, for example, vernacular search. Overall, we made the app vernacular. We are now supporting eight different languages. Mm. Now that helped a lot in making new to e-commerce users comfortable with the new e-commerce experience. I think bigger problem is in our marketplace we kind of sell a lot of long tail products. These are unbranded, they have an infinite pool of products mm. to choose from for a new user who is coming to the app for the first time. How does that user find the right product? Mm. It's almost impossible. So there we have leveraged data science to understand the intent implicitly, mm. so that we broadly predict what this user wants. And then the moment he opens the app or he or she opens the app, we show it upfront in the feed. Ah. to just reduce that overload of trying to figure out where do i go in the app second third layer to reach the right sort of categories so i think their data science has played a very important fascinating kithi let me get you to expand on that as the chief product officer of the company you know speaking of what and you mentioned that you're kind of predicting what the user wants and you keep it up front and center take us to how you know you shape user demand towards the right kind of items to buy by I want to look at it from the perspective of trust and quality, especially you know love at first sight. That you use it, you found it simple, you found it intuitive. Therefore, that sets the base of retention for you because the 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 first few interactions are very very important. Take us through you know the unique selling points of Misho, especially in making those initial interactions so smooth that the user decides to stay with you. Yeah, this is actually one of the most important problems that uh, we try to solve uh, at Misho, and also one of the most complex ones as well. like i think you were mentioning earlier uh, more than 50% of our new customers we have acquired in the last year have been new to e-commerce mm. right which means that they've never shopped online anywhere before so in their first few interactions the experience that you shape for them becomes critical and to solve for this i think we've looked at it in different ways i think one thing that we've done which is more a 
analytical exercise uh, which helps us a lot is define what we call a habit formation point mm. right, which is after x number of orders a user has placed in the first x months we know that their retention sort of then becomes stable right so our goal is every new customer who comes how do we get them to that point mm. right so that's sort of one framework that we that we use and then to enable that to happen i think there are multiple things that we that we work on i think one is just simplifying the core shopping experience which i think sanjeev mentioned the onboarding experience has to be simple cognitive overload has to be minimized uh, ensuring that the language is customized to the user's language ensuring that uh, there is more visual communication than textual communication because a lot of bharat customers are not used to reading stuff mm. they're used to looking at images and absorbing that's how they're trained on facebook and youtube and all of that so i think a lot of that helps then shaping demand towards the right type of products i think that's probably the toughest challenge mm. and given the long tail nature of the platform that sanjeev mentioned there are millions and millions of items how do you know what are the few things that will appeal to this customer mm. which is where the data science led personalization comes into the picture and which is more us predicting what they would want mm. what we've also done is us explicitly taking their intent as well which is channelizing the intent of the user for example you you installed the app you opened the app for the first time we've also created experiences where we ask you to choose a few categories mm. that appeal most to you and based on what they choose we dynamically curate the best selling items within those categories mm. and there we apply filters of quality trust based on other cust- new customers who have purchased this in the past and the user is happy to give you that information because it tweaks their search absolutely right. to their so so a lot of that we've uh, done so it's a combination of us predicting their intent using data science then us taking their intent explicitly mm. and then bringing all of this together through a very simplified user experience right which is what helps us solve this new user activation problem and then we keep uh, uh, building on our other propositions as well which is for example the fact that you can return any item that you don't like as a new user mm. so making them aware of returns and making it easy for them to raise a return making them easy for them to rate a product right because all of that builds trust and when the customer knows that look this e-commerce platform is trying to sell me things but if i don't like i can return as well mm. i can also give them a bad rating so that they know next time they'll show me a better thing Mm-hmm. so investing in core product experiences to enhance all of this uh, along with some of the other things i mentioned have literally helped us move more and more of these new customers and build that habit of shopping all right you clearly outlined the the new customer journey and how you kind of get them into the bucket of existing of retaining them but in terms of existing customers and retaining them you know i want to understand how do you what do you do to retain them because by metrics like say dau or mau and time spent on platform misho pretty much leads its competitors in e-commerce platforms and that's i believe you once said that people view it as entertainment with shopping and not just a sort of a transactional affair so take us through how you mold customer conversations into community building as a sort of an asset in, when it comes to retain yeah and this is actually where misho is a very unique uh, app or in e-commerce compared to everybody else and again as we spoke more to customers who started using misho we wanted to understand why do you shop here like what do you like about misho and mm. apart from the fact that there are a lot of items and the prices are great one thing we constantly hear is hey this is a platform where i want to come and browse through things even if i don't have any intent to buy anything mm. and this is very different from the conventional e-commerce paradigm right most e-commerce has worked on intent based uh, sort of buying which is you have something in mind you come and search for it and then you buy mm. whereas here what we see is people open the app because they have time on hand so this they is discovery have, then discovery you browse through it you like something you buy it mm. right and uh, and the other thing also that building on this what what we've invested in uh, over the last couple of years is building a lot of social elements into the app mm. for example there's a community where customers can share with other customers the items they have bought so that they also get inspired ah, to buy okay. they can put their comments and others can see hey this person has commented so much on this item must be very good so let me also try <laughs> it's right. a softer version of peer pressure right yeah peer pressure there's also a lot of gamification which is mm. if you buy more and more you get more rewards associated with it so all of these kinds of elements the community element the gamification element the fact that it's a discovery based platform makes it a non transactional effect Mm. right makes it more like an app which i want to use when i have time on my hand so it's almost starting to substitute a youtube or a facebook for them and not just a regular e-commerce app so that's sort of been our revelation and we've sort of continue to build on and it and that explains why you retain them because you've kind of 
you know made it multi modal not just a single mode a single thought behind accessing it but rather it's something you just use as a force of habit thing it's not yeah. necessary that you want to buy something you use that you want to check out what's what's the, what are the latest connections or what your friends are buying or made it a social experience of buying so yeah. to say so you stuck to your premise there expanding on that uh, sanjeev this shift from say intent based to discovery based buying take us uh, through you know more capitalizations coming in from misho on this trend and any other trends that you have spotted especially as your business has scaled up i believe five times in the last three quarters with nearly 110 million monthly active users in terms of capturing new trends and of course capitalizing on this existing trend of going with discovery based buying rather than intent based buying what's misho's game today so on the discovery side uh, users now come to the app like pp said not just to you know find specific categories but also you know explore lot more categories which mm. means category expansion becomes a very important problem for us to solve and their home page you know plays a very important role that is one of the critical real assets in the app where real estate in the app where you you know enable users to discover new categories even some of the fundamental things like your personalization algorithms should be a balance between explore and exploit mm. which is you understand the users existing preferences you exploit it more by showing similar products but you also try to expose user to different sets of categories which is more explore mm. side of things so that users get a healthy mix of both sides and accordingly they kind of start you know spending lot more time mm. in the app so that is definitely one part of it and we've seen users you know like it really well engagements increase or just increase because of that so that is one i think community like you mentioned we are seeing very high engagement some sort of social validation where users see some of the other users recommending specific products and then that becomes their preferred choice one interesting thing that we are experimenting with is life forms mm. where we see suppliers coming to misho and on a live streaming video they kind of explain what this product is what is the quality how does it look like and in a live q and a they answer the questions uh. so we were trying to this kind of simulate just a gimmick it's a it's a way that they effective they see as being an effective sort of Correct. bridge between themselves and Correct. and we've seen massive success for the suppliers in a, in this 30 minutes of live streaming they'll get lot more orders than they'll get in matter of days mm. through traditional kind of listing but also bigger thing and bigger jump in user experience here is that this simulates offline buying very kind of Closely, speaking right? directly to the merchant, exactly. so you don't feel that oh, there is yeah. I'm going to send a mail or some communication is going to be yeah. responded maybe in half an hour or one hour. Yeah, yeah. it's a direct interaction. You're right. Direct interaction. So that adds that human element. Trust. Yeah. Mm. All right. So that explains some of the numbers that we've seen, especially the blockbuster sale which happened recently. And if they, I want to take what Sanjeev mentioned and and bring you into that conversation because the Misho blockbuster, mega blockbuster sale that proved to be record breaking for your platform. with over 33 million orders placed with 64% of them coming from tier 4 cities and the latter part of that statistics is more in- interesting so i want to understand how did you manage your marketing and campaigns and communications with users to achieve these numbers because these users also are not metro they are tier 3 tier 4 cities and how did say platforms like clevertap uh, enable you to hyper personalize across channels during say big festival season big festival events but also off season we want to understand how that uh, partnership helps you do your retention really well with customers but first looking at the big picture the big success you've had with the festival yeah i think the festival season has been great success like you mentioned uh, and also we've seen unprecedented scale and engagement in, uh, from customers this time i think there are two big things in terms of Uh, what uh, preparation went into it uh, from a marketing standpoint that you mentioned i think one is just the brand marketing the the key proposition of our indian kapna market bringing it alive mm. in in sort of the different brand marketing campaigns this time we leverage celebrities as well we even vernacularized it significantly to different parts of the country uh, a lot of that obviously created much much more awareness uh, about uh, misho building on some of the things that we've done in the past i think that that really uh, helped a lot coming to communications which i think is what actually drives a lot of the impact on the sale day at different points in time i think there a lot of investment into the communications infrastructure that has happened mm. in the last year year and a half has has helped a lot right 
So, so the scale at which we send tens of millions of notifications every day uh, is something that not many platforms are able to, right? And that's where CleverTap has been a strong partner for us. The planning for doing all of this almost starts like a couple of months before the, <laughs> the sale event itself. I think that's that's a, a, a big a big boost to this. In terms of what we do uniquely well here uh, is was hyper personalization, like you said, across different dimensions. Right. Mm. One is the content of the notifications. What do you send? Right. There, I think there's extreme level of personalization in terms of category preferences of users, what they've bought in the past what new things they want to explore, et cetera. Second is the volume of the notifications as well. How many do you send in a day to mm. every customer? That also so is there's no fatigue in a sense. There's no fatigue because fatigue leads to uninstalls and so on. And the third is even uh, personalization in, to some extent in terms of timing of the day. Mm. When do you send? So what do you send? How many do you send? When do you send? All mm. of it is actually deeply personalized using a lot of the data and the communication infrastructure that we've built. And, and also what we found about our users is because they look at us as a discovery based e-commerce platform, their threshold for getting notifications is much higher than mm. your mm. Metro tier one customer. So if you and I get more than five notifications a day from an app, we get bugged. But here, because the user base is so large and the preferences are so unique, mm. there are a lot of customers who like 20 notifications a day. That could be. Okay. There are some who don't. And that's why this personalization helps rather than a single broad brush approach. And this mm. is what we've realized creates a lot of that intent to come and browse on the app because suddenly they see something, they want to come. Right? It's all about the context. Yeah. So, so I think that's sort of what we've done this time and it's worked well. And it's also something that we've built over mm. the past year, year and a half. And obviously, CleverTap has been a great partner. Yeah, could you us. give us some of the nuts and bolts, any anecdotes you could share about how this partnership helps you do re retention well? Any, any, any case studies you could cite from your experience? Sure. I think a lot of the capabilities, I think the CleverTap uh, team has uh, provided have been massively useful. Like for example, the ease of creating micro cohorts and creating campaigns very seamlessly, right? That's not something that you can do very easily unless you have all of those capabilities. Mm. Then the other thing is managing the scale uh, in terms of sending 30, 40, 50 million notifications a day. Uh, is again something that uh, systems have to be built for, which is where I think the CleverTap team works closely with us to plan and, and organize their infrastructure as well. Uh, and also giving us a lot of intelligence on the campaigns that we have sent as well. Mm. A lot of analytics around it so that we can use that to improve further campaigns. So all of these capabilities, I think, are something that uh, that uh, without access to them, I don't think we would have been able to uh, achieve all of this. All right. Now that we've kind of completed the brass stacks journey of why Misho does uh, retention so well. Let's also look at it from an organizational structure perspective. And Sanjeev, I'll bring you on this because when we look at startups, you know, they usually have a high churn rate. But here, Misho has more than 1,700 employees and looking to add 1,500 more this year as per what I've read uh, in media reports with the bulk coming from engineering and data science team. So what does Misho do to retain its employees in a, a very highly competitive space? And enable them to work successfully towards that North Star of, of user first. How, you know, how do you attract the best and yeah. brightest in that context? You know, take us through your Think 10x philosophy because it sounds great, but I want to understand what's actually at work in the organization where it structures itself for user first. Yeah, I think the fundamental thing here is culture, which kind of helps in attracting the right talent mm -hmm. and retaining them. And broadly, I believe there are three things which matters for everyone, for every great talent out there. There are three things which matters, right? One is mission, which is they should have exciting enough mission to kind of spend large part of their day working for a company, right? That mission should be bold enough, should be fulfilling enough as well. They should feel content kind of working towards that mission. Second is autonomy, which is mission is great, but if you're not enabling that talent to pursue that mission in a fairly independent manner, people will get frustrated. And there we have solved it by you know, organizing teams in a manner in which they are broadly self-sufficient, mm. which is all the complementary skill sets put together, back-end, front-end, Android, business, product, forming a team together. And there are multiple such teams pursuing different problem statements mm. with very minimal dependencies across different teams, which then enables autonomy so that they can move faster with very minimal kind of overhead, coordination overhead. And third is transparency, which helps in building trust. 
I think there has to be very clear communication and information flow growing, going on from the top level to the last level. Not just about good news, but all the bad news as well. Which means you grow, you share all the metrics. You don't grow, you share all the problems. No hiding from you know, your own people, right? So I think broadly we have done these three things, right? Which helps in uh, building a right culture where we are able to retain talent. We have one of the lowest uh, attrition in not just engineering, but overall company. Uh, but beyond that, we have this Think 10x philosophy that you mentioned, right? That is an interesting one where we push people to take bolder bets. Think moon big shots. moon shots. And it's okay to fail, which means you have to create a culture where there is no fear of failure. Mm. People will fail when they aim big, mm. but they don't have to succeed every time. They succeed more than half the time, job is done because now you're aiming big and people are not afraid of making mistakes while doing that. Mm. So I think combined culture plus this Think 10x philosophy uh, seems like very attractive. <laughs> to most of the talent out there. But it also seems that, you know, Misho is customer zero. You learn from it. Just as you enable your customers to think 10x, you're also using the same philosophy to enable your employees to think yeah. 10x. And it's great to see. And I, I look forward to all the moonshots that would come about because yeah. of that philosophy. So as we head to the final leg of the conversation, let me tie some conversation points up, especially on the evolution aspect. Kiti, as you mentioned, you know, the evolution from, say, social commerce to a broader e-commerce play. Misho is expanding into a lot of product categories and markets as well. So in that context, how is the brand's marketing and communication evolving as well? Since, you know, these days B2B, B2C, D2C, all those lines are blurring. So from yeah. a marketing and communications perspective, how are the tweaks coming in to keep up with the times? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. And I think our brand proposition has also evolved. And now mm. it's our Indian Kapna market. And, and the reason why we also chose that because it's very universal in nature. What mm. we want anybody to take away is for every Indian, in a billion Indians, if they want to engage in commerce, then Misho is the place. Mm. Whether it's a customer who wants to buy something for him or herself, if, or if it was a reselling entrepreneur who wants to sell to somebody else, or whether it's a supplier or a seller who wants to sell, uh, right? This is the platform where they can come and do all of that. Right? That's, the, that's the positioning. And and once we've moved to this positioning, then it becomes agnostic to B2C, B2B, D2C, everything that you mentioned. And we want to keep building more and more of that because we've just scratched the surface. There are so many pockets uh, of uh, supply in the country that we haven't tapped into. And especially with the new regulation of non-GST suppliers coming in, we will unlock a huge set of uh, millions of small sellers who can come and sell. And we want them to think, this is the place where I can come and sell. And same thing for customers as well. as we penetrate Bharat more and more. The tier 5 customer should think that this is where I can come and buy. So I think that's the universal positioning that we've created and all our campaigns now will sort of further move in that direction. You're already well positioned for it. And of course, since this is just the start of the opportunity, we do music to the ears of investors because Misho turned unicorn last year. So in this, in this growth journey, I guess you could say that you've had uh, for the lack of a more bombastic word. I'll just keep it simple. For in this growth journey that you've had, what's the biggest lesson that you would like to share with a lot of our viewers who are, say, startup founders themselves? What would you say? I think two lessons here. One mm -hmm. is, as an engineering head, right? Only thing which matters for the engineering team is moving faster, which is ability to iterate fast to solve a lot of problems or try to solve problems faster is most important thing. Tech stack is important but secondary. Mm. Everything else is secondary, especially when you're in a hyper growth journey. Just focus on building the foundation which enables you to iterate very fast. Second is, and this is from our own learnings again, which is don't get wedded to your own idea. <laughs> Just spend a lot of time and be open-minded. That matters a lot. That, that sounds easier than it than yeah, actually is. is. So on in that context, as you earlier mentioned, right? you, you want to sometimes work on the tech but the leadership also comes into yeah. play where you have to manage people as well. In that context, any other advice that you would offer to our viewers, especially in, when it comes to taking that big leap in business, what would you say? To them? I think the right time to start is now. It's <laughs> always going to be fewer opportunities. <laughs> Life is going to become difficult always, but I think it's, it's always too late to start. It's, it's today that you have to do if you want to ever do it. If we move from just do it to do it now. Yeah. All right. Kirti, your 
your wise words to our audience startup founders are watching what would you say to them on taking a big leap in business yeah having seen misho's journey and also some other startups i think one thing that i've realized is it's a very tough journey right mm. so the two things that i would share is one uh being very passionate about the problem that you're solving i think is most important because it will never be a linear journey mm. it will be non linear and uh, if you need to persist in that non linear journey then there has to be something that keeps you going right and it can't be your numbers etc because they'll go up they'll come down so it has to be some passion for the problem that you're solving and the impact you're creating i think that's one second one which i think i've realized mostly at visho is go after big opportunities rather than mm. small opportunities because the effort needed to uh, build a big company and a small company and mostly same mm. so better to swing for the fences versus trying to do something small because you'll face the same challenges in both places at least in one you have the opportunity of creating an outsized outcome so so look for big opportunities is, is what i would also say well i hope you take those those words of advice those words of wisdom from our leaders to heart and maybe we could see the next unicorns coming out of our viewers who are watching but on that note thank you so much sanjeev and kirti for sharing with us your thoughts your insights and of course this growth journey this fantastic growth journey that misho has had in its mission to democratize e-commerce and build her indian ka apna market i wish you all the best for future endeavors as well and of course to our viewers you've learned lots of lessons you've learned the growth story of misho it's time now to understand more about the investment story of misho so stay tuned to that Social commerce is an emerging sector in India and as per reports it has the potential to grow to 16 to 20 billion dollars by FY25 at a compounded annual growth rate of 55 to 60% that's truly a mark of e-commerce democratizing India and also this offers a huge opportunity for players in the segment in the near future so let's understand more about this let's now speak with Mukul Arora partner at Elevation Capital on how he sees the social commerce segment panning out and what made him decide to pack Misho thank you so much for joining us here on the investment story as part of the big leap growth story mukul thank you for having me excited to be here all right let's start with the origin of that investment because uh, elevation capital bet big on misho during its seed round with a 3 million dollar investment so what sealed the deal for you let me tell you the story from the beginning so we invested in misho in mid 2017 but i had actually known vidit and sanjeev from late 2015 mm -hmm. so almost one and a half years before we invested and uh, for the first time when we spoke to them at that time their thesis was very different mm -hmm. so misho used to be a storefront for resellers it was not yet a marketplace so if you are a reseller they would help you build your online presence take orders deliver orders what then happened was over 2 years i would have met them probably 8 to 10 times and two things really stood out for me the first one was they were very very customer obsessed mm -hmm. they would listen to their customers very closely in their first avatar they would go and sit with the resellers and see actually how they were using the app and then they would adapt their business basis that so from those insights they realized that hey for these resellers mm -hmm. the big pain point is not creating that storefront but actually supply because they are small businesses and they are sourcing either from a small wholesaler or a small trader and they neither get the best selection nor do they get the best prices mm -hmm. so that's when uh, they pivoted to a marketplace for those and then when i met uh, vidit and sanjeev again at that time the signs of product market fit were very clear mm -hmm. they were growing extremely fast even though they were almost out of capital at that time so they had no money to spend on marketing mm -hmm. uh, but still they were growing fast had amazing product market fit had very strong feedback from resellers 
and that's when uh, we realized they were onto something very special and there is no way we could not partner with them so mid 2017 is when we decided to uh, partner with them and do the seed investment all right let's expand on that and understand from you what made that you investment story unique for you mm-hmm. because with it instant jeep you know it's also about understanding the founders reading yes. the founders so yeah. to say understanding the team understanding the business model so take us through those various aspects and bring it all together on what makes this investment unique for you i would say a few things uh, one i already spoke about founders customer obsession which to date they has been their biggest strength like even now one of their values is listen or die uh where what they mean is that unless we listen to our customers very closely as a company we are going to die and and that stays true true to this date second is uh i have now known vidit and sanjeev for almost 7 years mm-hmm. and the way both of them have grown as leaders has been phenomenal and very inspirational so if you look at sanjeev before starting misho he was uh, in sony and he was an individual contributor or maybe it was managing like a small team three lines of businesses he was looking at i think dslrs and and so on right and so right and now today uh, he is running a team which has hundreds of engineers this sale season we did more orders than amazon and it went flawlessly there was no failure so when you see someone growing that well it's just unbelievable mm-hmm. similarly when i look at vidit uh, and in as part of our jobs we meet hundreds of founders every month most founders are either very strong visionaries or they are great operators vidit is the only founder i have met who is great at both of these so he can see where the strategic shifts are happening therefore how do i need to align my org and culture according to that and then what do we need to do in terms of execution so this kind of growth in founders has been the most unique part uh for me and as an investor uh, when we invested in the seed round for first couple of years i used to play a mentor role uh for vidit but last 2 3 years i get to learn from him as much if not more and he is as much a mentor to me so again seeing that transformation in our journey has been quite phenomenal and and the way it has shown is as the team has grown as the founders have grown the ambition has become much bigger and as you know now it's no more a marketplace which is catering only to social commerce and resellers but now it's about democratizing e-commerce for everyone and now it's a direct to consumer platform all right i also want to get your perspective on misho's uh, consumer retention strategy so on that how well has misho's no frills approach to pricing work to ensure higher retention rates of customers in this very hyper competitive environment where there are larger players who have deeper pockets what's right. your view on this right so if you look at the larger players they have made very different design choices when uh, amazon came to india they brought their western model to india which is that we want people to come take our prime subscription and get products delivered uh, the next day uh, they are targeting people like you and me who value convenience uh, and uh, we are okay paying a little bit more as long as we get that convenience and if you have that design choice you have to build massive warehouses throughout the country you have to build your own logistics uh, team and those are the choices they have taken which makes it a much much higher cost business and therefore uh, it all of that cost adds up in the supply chain in misho from day 1 our uh, core was to ensure prices got to resellers and over time to end consumers at the lowest prices so we build that business in an asset light manner no logistics no warehousing no commission so suppliers come list their prat- uh, products they compete with each other on the platform and as a result consumers get by far the lowest prices mm-hmm. now if we look at mass of india you take out top 30 40 50 million users mass of india cares more about pricing over convenience uh, they are happy to wait two more days if they are getting products 20% cheaper mm-hmm. and that is what to your question has helped us one acquire a much larger customer base and lot more to be acquired and when they are getting products cheaper the frequency automatically becomes higher which leads to a much higher retention as well mm-hmm. so even though it feels like it's hyper competitive market uh this mass market was completely uncatered to before misho and even now the incumbents are not able to cater to that so it's pretty much an open playing field uh, so the mass misho. market focus remains even as its evolution happens because misho is also expanding into many new product categories so to say uh, which will involve a huge amount of investment so your view on this in you know in the sense of misho evolving sort of into a broader e-commerce player versus say a social commerce player what are your thoughts on that yeah so the mass market focus will stay and will only keep getting stronger 
and the evolution from social commerce to e-commerce has already happened. That's the beauty and, and there uh, last year when we started making that shift, what we saw was actually last to last year, 2020 post COVID, even though the platform was built only for resellers, uh, consumers automatically started gravitating to the platform with zero marketing. So we were not doing any marketing. The checkout was still for a reseller that you would put customer's address, you would also put how much you want to mark up. It was not like a consumer checkout. Still consumers were gravitating to the platform and that's when we realized it was an open field. Uh, last two years when we really leaned into that opportunity, we had to spend a lot in terms of acquiring customers and making them aware that now it is a consumer facing platform and not a reseller facing platform. Mm -hmm. But thankfully now we are at that critical mass where uh, we have a sizable customer base, we have a sizable supplier base and now the flywheel is only, only rotating faster and faster. Mm -hmm. So if I look at our cash burn today, it's uh, one sixth of where it was earlier this year. Mm -hmm. While we are growing uh, more than 50% year on year. That must be music to your ears. Music will be next year when we'll be profitable. <laughs> but we are already well. But you're almost there. I mean, almost you there. Reduce your cash burn. That's that's a sign that you're heading into green heading, pastures. Yeah. So that path is very, very clear now. And that's where to your point, I don't think uh, it's going to need a lot of investment going forward. A lot of investment is behind us. Mm -hmm. And from here, it's going to be even more capital efficient. Uh, for us uh, as we build this platform much larger. All right, considering the phase that you're entering before I let you go, what are the next big growth opportunities for Misho that you as an investor are most excited about? We are sitting on a gold mine. So we don't need to look at newer opportunities. We need to look at how do we make the best of this opportunity. And let me elaborate on that. If you look at retail in India today, it's a trillion dollar market, give or take. In next decade, it will become two trillion dollars. If 10 years out, our e-commerce penetration is where it is in developed world, which is 20, 25, 30%. We'll have a $500 billion e-commerce market. Mm. If at that time, uh, Misho is the leading marketplace, which I am certain it's not an if it is going to happen. And even if they have 20% share, it's a $100 billion opportunity that we are talking about. And when we get to that scale, it means hundreds of millions of customers are buying on Misho and they are able to get better products, lower prices. So fundamentally, Misho is helping them improve their lifestyle. Millions of suppliers will be selling on Misho. So Misho would have given birth to a lot of suppliers. They would have helped a lot of suppliers grow their businesses on the platform. And millions of uh, delivery fleet, delivery boys would be delivering Misho's parcel, although they would be still be working with our partners, not our own logistics team. So the opportunity to have a massive commercial impact and a massive social impact uh, is just unbelievable. So we have to stay razor focused on execution and uh, make sure that our value prop both for suppliers and customers keep getting stronger uh, and uh, 10 years out Misho is going to look much much more phenomenal. So we've just scratched the surface of the investment story when it comes to Misho as you said 100 billion dollar opportunity. So next stop Decacon and then we'll see where things go from there for Misho. But in the meanwhile, Mukul, thank you so much for joining us here on the Big Leap Growth Stories as part of the Investment Story Profile for Misho. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. And with that, we come to the end of this episode of ET Brand Equity Presents The Big Leap, powered by Clevertap. I hope you enjoyed listening to these leaders and their growth stories. Thank you so much for watching and we'll be back again with the next episode with two more unique stories. Till then, this is your host Gautam Srinivasan signing off. Have a great day.